When we look at protein synthesis, there's a number of different places uh, that we can target, uh, that are targeted for, uh, during the protein synthesis process. Uh, you may remember a quick uh, review is that in protein synthesis, you have a messenger RNA molecule that was made during transcription that is brought to the ribosomes, uh, which are these large uh, non-membrane bound organelles, and the transfer RNAs, shown here with this sort of clover leaf shape, bring in the amino acids. Um, there's a codon and anti-codon that have to match up, you may remember, in order to uh, decide which amino acid gets added to the growing chain of amino acids as you make a protein. Uh, with that in mind, uh, streptomycin, for example, uh, is something that actually changes the shape of the what's known as the 30S component of the ribosome, causing the, the ribosome to misread the genetic code, which would lead in producing a protein that is different than had been coded for, uh, which obviously could cause problems in a cell. If you're making a protein that is the wrong structure, it won't have the same function. Uh, tetracyclines interfere a little differently. Tetracyclines uh, interfere with the attachment of the transfer RNA to that messenger RNA. So they get in the way of uh, bringing in the right amino acids to the growing chain of, of uh, amino acids in the growing polypeptide. Chloramphenicol has a little different place that it targets. It uh, binds to the 50S portion of the ribosome and actually inhibits that formation of the new peptide bond shown there by the, the pink arrow right in here when you're putting on a new amino acid onto the growing chain. So chloramphenicol again has a little different target. So there's three different areas where uh, protein synthesis can be uh, impacted by antibiotic. One of the most common ways to determine in the lab the effectiveness of an antibiotic, uh, pretty simple to do, is known as the Kirby-Bauer test. It's also known as the disk diffusion method. Uh, in this procedure, this technique, what you would do is you would take a, an actively growing culture of the uh, bacterium that you're studying, spread it out on a plate, uh, and then you would carefully layer onto or place onto the plate these little discs that look like hole punches of uh, that are impregnated with antibiotics at certain concentrations, and tap them to the plate, incubate it overnight, for 24 hours and then come back the next day and you would see something like the in, uh, indicated on the image here on the slide where the bacteria will depending on whether it's sensitive or resistant to the antibiotics may grow up close to the disc or have this large what's known as zone of inhibition what you would do that next would be to measure the actual zone of inhibition across and then you would compare that to a table that will have a bunch of standard values that if it's greater than a certain size would indicate that the uh, bacterium is sensitive to the antibiotic. Anything below a certain size would mean that it is resistant to that antibiotic. Each antibiotic has a, will have a different zone of inhibition which would determine uh, its sensitivity. The terms we you will see used uh, most commonly to describe that is uh, an antibiotic, uh, a bacterium being sensitive to an antibiotic, which means that it would be killed or uh, slowed, its growth slowed down by the presence of the antibiotic at a certain concentration, or it would, might be described as being resistant, which means that it can grow even in the presence of that antibiotic and is not killed by it or inhibited by it. Sometimes you will see things referred to as being intermediate in their sensitivity which obviously would be somewhere between the size of a zone of inhibition for a sensitive versus a resistant bacterium. Again, each of those is, would be determined by uh, looking it up on a chart. This is a quick, easy way to determine the rough sensitivity uh, to antibiotics of a particular organism. Uh, a little more sophisticated test that gives you a little more quantitative data uh, is using a broth dilution uh, experiment in order to determine what's known as the MIC. The MIC, which stands for the minimum inhibitory concentration, would be determined by first you would uh, prepare a serial dilution of the antibiotic that you're studying. On this uh, slide here, you can see the tubes are set up with a different dilution series uh, for the antibiotic, where the concentration here is, is much higher. And as, the, as you move left to right on the screen, the concentration goes down, and this is giving you the, the fold uh, dilution. So you'd have a series of tubes set up uh, of different concentrations. You would then add uh, a measured amount of the actively growing culture. Uh, 
that you're testing to the tubes. You'd incubate them overnight and then you'd come back the next day and look to see uh, how much growth there had been in there. You could measure that obviously using the spectrophotometer. We talked about that earlier. We measured the absorbance at 600 nanometers and look for where the cloudiness, which indicates active growth, drops off. Um, you can see on this slide here it shows you there's a, a yellow line indicating the point at which uh, the growth actually gets inhibited. In other words, a concentration of anti antibiotic above that point um, you don't see any growth. It's not cloudy and that value would be known as the minimum inhibitory concentration. And the minimum amount of antibiotic you need in order to inhibit the growth of the bacterium. In this example on the top row you have the S. aureus which uh, would have turbid growth here until you get down to this yellow line here and then below that it would be uh, no cloudiness. So the minimum inhibitory concentration would be somewhere between the 1 to 64 and 1 to 128 full dilution. On the bottom row, same antibiotic, a different uh, bacterium, E. coli, it may take a much higher concentration to inhibit the growth and that would be seen by uh, cloudiness in a whole bunch more of the tubes until you get down to, in this case, about between 1 to 4 and 1 to 8 uh, of a dilution. The MBC is known as the a minimum bactericidal concentration. In other words, even though there's no growth in these tubes down here that, that, are, that or appear that there's no growth or not cloudy, there may actually still be bacteria in there that they're just not actively dividing. In order to determine the minimum bactericidal concentration, the minimum amount to actually kill them, you would take some of the uh, culture out of those tubes, put it on a fresh nutrient agar plate without antibiotics and incubate it overnight and see if there are any cells actually still in there that are alive that when they're removed from the presence of the antibiotic would be able to grow. Determining the MIC and the MBC will help you determine whether it is a bactericidal or a bacteriostatic antibiotic. It also is useful for a physician when they're trying to prescribe an antibiotic because you want to use the, the minimum amount of antibiotic to be effective because frequently the higher doses will have certain side effects and you also don't want to uh, over prescribe the antibiotic and cause uh, secondary infections which is something we'll see later on. This actual uh, procedure is what you're going to be doing in the second part of the case of the curious infection. Uh, we're going to be looking at a couple different bugs and a couple different antibiotics uh, to try to help Dr. Knows It All solve um, her conundrum. We move on to antibiotic resistance. Um, we talk about an anti uh, a bacterium being resistant to a particular antibiotic and how that comes about. There are really four basic ways, and say it shows you here on the slide, in which bacteria combat the effectiveness of the antimicrobial agents. And really, it's an arms race here. The, uh, as quickly as, as antibiotics have been discovered and, and developed, um, bacteria have figured out ways to block that or prevent it from being um, actually an antibiotic. The four basic ways that you, we see bugs that will resist antibiotics. Uh, the first one is through destruction or inactivation of the drug. We will see that with the penicillin drugs. Um, there are bacteria that uh, produce an enzyme known as beta-lactamase, which, no surprise, is able to break down beta-lactam rings. We saw that in the structure of the penicillin. So if, an anti if a bacterium can produce beta-lactamase, it'll be able to break down penicillin, which will prevent penicillin from inhibiting with the cell wall synthesis which means the bacteria would be resistant to the penicillin, not impacted by it. There are other examples where destruction or inactivation of the drug by an enzyme um, makes the, the bacterium resistant to that particular antibiotic. Another strategy is to actually prevent uh, penetration to the target site within the microbe. There are some microbes that can prevent the antibiotic from actually passing through the cell membrane. Uh, there are also examples, uh, for example, with uh, tetracycline, where the, the bugs may let the tetracycline in, but then bind it up inside the cell and prevent it from reaching the ribosome, which is where the tetracycline actually has its, its effect. So that's another different sort of uh, technique for developing resistance. Uh, third one is to alter the drug's target sites. Uh, for example, the, many of the antibiotics affect the ribosome. Well, if the bacterium can evolve or come about with a change in shape of the ribosome, the antibiotic may not actually bind to it and therefore can't prevent 
that uh, reading of the messenger RNA or the production of those um, peptide bonds as the protein starts growing. Uh, another option that bacteria have sort of figured out or evolved is the idea of an efflux pump. In other words, as soon as they allow the, the antibiotic to come into the cell, but as quickly as it comes in, it is quickly pumped out of the cell so that it doesn't prevent it from crossing the border, but as soon as it does, it kicks the stuff out so that it no longer will have its effect inside the cell. Uh, we will see all of the, not necessarily all of these in the lab, but we will experiment with a couple of these different um, antibiotic resistance uh, strategies as we do some um, uh, work with the bacterial genetics, which we'll see in the, in the coming weeks. So that concludes this little video lesson on the control of microbial growth.